Welcome to the virtual book launch, Developing Global Business Communication in Asia, a business simulated case study approach hosted by Routledge. My name is Melanie Yostri, and I am pleased to be your host for today's launch event. There is an exciting lineup for today as we hear from our authors, Dr. Lockwood and Dr. Elias, followed by some comments and close off with the Q&A segment. Now, if you have any questions during the session, please type them in the chat box. This launch will be recorded. We will have a Q&A session at the end to address all your questions. Without further ado, I would like to welcome our Managing Director, Barry Clark, to kickstart today's launch. Mr. Clark, please. Thank you, Mel. Good afternoon, and I think good morning to uh, Jane and Neil, who are in London, I believe. Yes. Thank you so much for inviting me to say just a few words before we talk more specifically about your book, which I really look forward to reading. Communication, of course, makes or breaks companies, makes or breaks whole countries, arguably, so it's such an important area. Um, and Routledge, we're very proud of our history of uh, publishing, not only in this area of communication, but business, applied linguistics, and all related areas. So I particularly like the idea of bringing some of those disciplines together in this book, and that's why I certainly intend to read it. Um, we have published other books around this kind of topic, but it seems that we need to continue to get this message across. Um, dialogue is such an important aspect of communication. I, hopefully that can be, we can talk about that maybe a bit later. Um, also the context in which you are communicating. Um, my own daughter does applied linguistics as a degree from Glasgow in applied linguistics. And we have many discussions around the dinner table about the importance of choosing the right word, the right intonation and in the right context. Um, and as I say, in business and perhaps in the business of politics and the business of bringing countries together, which is particularly challenging in this pandemic, I think it's ever more important to focus on communication. Um, Routledge itself is a, is a well-established publisher. I think many of you know us, um, one of the biggest publishers in the world, largest in social sciences and humanities. We're very proud of our tradition going right back actually over 200 years. Um, and we're looking very much forward uh, to, the, to the future of continuing to publish wonderful books um, like the one that Jane and Neil are presenting to the market with this book launch. So now I'd like to go back to Jane and Neil in London, I believe. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so are we ready to go? Thank you, Barry. My pleasure. Okay. All right, so, so Neil and I will um, do a, a quick presentation of the, the kind of background and structure of developing global business communication in Asia. Um, and we have a couple of people who will just be perhaps commenting at the end, and then we'll open it up for, for um, questions and answers. So please hold your, hold your questions and, and comments till, till later on. This will take about sort of 20 to 30 minutes, no more. So, I can't move that. Okay, so, so here we've got another um, business course book, but it's not just another business course book because what we're really trying to do um, in this course book is to make it unique. Um, I worked in Asia for decades and I always had difficulty finding an Asian focused um, set of materials. Um, so, Given that Asia is one of the fastest growing English speaking regions in the world, I think this, this had become critical to do. The other thing is about this business course book is that it's research informed. I mean, behind what we're, we're doing in this book is really based on research into business communication. And this has been a very rich area of academic study over the last sort of two to three decades. Things have changed enormously in, um, in business communication. I mean, we've got this, this phenomenon of globalization, which actually hasn't been evident that much in the last 18 months. 
and the beginning of remote work practices. So this will, will be something that if you weren't familiar with before the pandemic, you're very familiar with now, whether you're a teacher, a researcher, a, a, a business manager. The impact of technology has been incredible um, over the last 20 to 30 years. Um, but how has this impacted business communication? We're still opening course books that talk about, you know, the kind of business letter, the business report and everything that, that doesn't really um, uh, look at the impact of technology. I mean, we do talk about email exchanges, but there's a lot more going on in terms of chat and, and, um, and social media. And the final, final feature of this book, I think, is the importance of BELF, Business English as a Lingua Franca, um, and our ability, whether we're first language speakers of business communication or second language speakers of communication, our ability to use accommodation and intercultural adaptive strategies in business exchange has become really critical. So these are some of the things, these are some of the features of the, the course book. The guiding principles of the course book are context is everything, situation is everything. So we're really promoting authenticity in the kind of case study that we use. Now this authenticity um, derives from, you know, working with over 50 organizations in Asia, Australia, Europe, and, and US. So collectively, Neil and I have actually quite a lot of experience in working with, with businesses across, across the, the world. Um, the other thing is to try and incorporate into the course book the, the actual nature of business texts and genres used in business. Um, and incorporating, you know, technology in the new sort of genres and texts that are being created. Um, another thing that has come out of research is the importance of intertextuality. Um, intertextuality really relates to how texts are interconnected. If I get an angry email from my boss, that is critical. Um, in terms of how I construct a response to that anger. Um, so every text in the case study that we look at is connected to other texts in the course book. And these impact their construction. And it's based on scenarios and char characters um, to really get the students engaged and involved in the case study. So they build up a kind of understanding of who the characters are, what the situation is, and so forth. Um, and this carries um, a momentum going forward. So the specifications of the course book are very straightforward. It's there to understand the objectives of global business communication in Asia, um, both within and beyond the region, because they're connected all over the world. It's assuming a CF uh, a CFR entry level of B2, which is good intermediate. Um, the book is not trying to get people to be native speakers. The book is trying to get people to perform business communication better than they were at the beginning um, with good accommodation and cultural adaptability. Along the way, they may improve their actual traditional um, language proficiency levels, but the aim is more performative in business communication rather than proficiency oriented in business communication. It covers all skills and integrates um, listening, speaking, reading and writing in an ongoing way. I mean, if you're a teacher that is focusing more on the written communication, you can use those sort of tasks and texts in the book. If you're focusing more on listening and speaking, you can you can focus on that. So there's flexibility in how you as a teacher um, can use can use this book, but the the skills are integrated all the way through. 
We've included background readings because, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's evidence-based, it's based on research. And so if this book, for example, is being used in a postgraduate course um, on English for business professionals, it may be appropriate to draw attention to the kind of research that has been done in this area. Um, so that they can link that theory to, to practice. And, it's, and the scenarios are based on real business issues and dilemmas that um, we've seen um, in our experience in business co businesses around, around Asia. So the new norms in business communication um, are reflected very, very strongly. Um, in this publication. Um, it explores the intercultural and linguistic norms in Asian business exchanges. So it's really looking at the interface between Western and Eastern cultural norms. It's assuming virtual communication and remote communication as a norm. Um, and certainly businesses today would say most of their business exchanges are not happening in physical meeting rooms, they're happening in virtual meeting rooms. It highlights the importance of authenticity and intertextuality in spoken and written texts in, in the context we present. It takes a second language as well as a first language perspective, um, where Belf Business English as a Lingua Franca is a norm. And as you all know, the the more second language speakers talking to other second language speakers in Asia in a business communication context. So this is important to, to really address this issue and have this as a cornerstone of our, our course book. So connected to that, it develops an understanding and the use of language accommodation strategies where you're always adjusting your communication, whether you're first or second language speaker, to the person that you are speaking to or that you are writing to. Um, this is a, a sort of um, hidden skill that we are really trying to sort of open up and look at with our students as part of their better performance in business communication. And hand in hand with that, this, it develops an understanding and skills in the use of cultural adaptability strategies. And we don't only mean when we talk about culture, ethnicity, but also the different professional and business cultures that they need to adapt to as they go out from university and, and get their jobs. So I'm now going to hand over to Neil, who was um, critical in actually thinking about the story um, as well as the, the, the sort of business problems and issues um, that this book is based on. And I certainly couldn't have done a good, as good a job in putting the book together if I hadn't had um, Neil as the business expert um, telling me whether the, this was authentic or not authentic. So I'm going to hand over to him as he talks about the business scenario and the two companies that actually um, this, this course book are based on. Okay, thank you, Jane. Um, yes, yeah, so I've been working in, in Asia and Australia for about the last, oh, too many years to count. Um, both working as a consultant with companies and also running companies. And so we built this very much based on uh, things that we knew about companies we've worked with over that period. So there are two main companies used in this book. Communication is a Singapore-based marketing consultancy company. Um, and like many companies nowadays, it has sub offices and people working out of different countries, people working out of Hong Kong, India, and Philippines in this case. And GlobeNet is a telco, telecommunications company, headquartered in London, UK, and with its regional headquarters in Hong Kong. And essentially, communication is a young company focused on 
the globalized world. It's done previous work launching a dedicated Sumo TV channel in Europe uh, and various other international units. So it's, it's working very much in that global scenario. Whereas GlobeNet is, it sells broadband SIM card packages, and it's looking to expand in Asia, as are many European and American companies, through an offering of uh, what they're calling well, an offering of free international access to specific countries called Rome Like Your Home. And essentially, GlobeNet is then inviting marketing companies to respond to a request for proposal, which is a very typical way of starting a business relationship. They invite people to develop a campaign to support and manage sales, put a budget together and explain how they're going to do it. And in this scenario, communication wins that bid and the book then tracks the progress of delivery and uh, hopefully to its final success. The project itself um, builds for a, a 10 unit, 70 hour program. Um, but as Jane said, some of that can be selective. Uh, it doesn't have, have all to be done at the same time. It covers reading and writing and the whole gamut of business reading and writing, email exchanges, LinkedIn and, and profiles for CVs, covering letters, texts, etc. Um, all based on the project. So each step builds on the step before in terms of the information used and reused. And in, in listening and speaking, there are short pitch speeches and, and clearly with marketing, there are pitches for what they're about to do. There are meetings, virtual meetings, face-to-face -face meetings, presentations, phone exchanges, all based on the project again and each building on the one before. So the main characters, and, and the reason we have photographs there and, and brief descriptions of the characters, are that these people are important in terms of building student engagement and in terms of building student involvement. Now, they need to identify with some of these characters. They will be working with the characters in the book. They respond to emails from them. They role play as them. And, and they follow their work progress through the story so far and, and the different scenarios that come up. So as I said, 10 units, 70 hours. Um, and just, I'm not gonna read through them, but essentially it goes through being invited to tender, responding to the invite, winning the bid. And winning the bid is actually only the start of the real work in these projects because having won the bid you then have to deliver and that's um the difficult thing um and then you know essentially uh you'll see unit eight problems 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 we want to see proper problems we want to see the way in which business really works so the aim of this apart from improving their english considerably is that Ideally, they should be able to walk out at the end of this course, get a job in an advertising agency and be fully productive from day <laughs> one. But yeah. we shall see. Thanks. So the story so far, as I said, it builds on the characters and it builds on the, the interest. So each of those units has a, a, a narrative reading called the story so far. Uh, and I'll cover that in just a minute. And then that develops characters, it introduces real business situations and problems. Uh, so as an example, it, it has issues of uh, appropriate behavior at work. It has issues of um, diversity, um, issues of discipline and, and managing people, um, all expressed in, in meetings and emails and other text types. So in unit two, I'm going to read the story so far to give you a picture of, of how that works. Unit two is called Opportunity Knocks for Communication. And it tells them how they received the request for proposal, the RFP, 
and how they reacted to it. So it, it shows you the way that the characters work. And this will take just three or four minutes to read. I'd suggest you just close your eyes and let it wash over you. Um, because uh, this is actually my opportunity to be the novelist that I always dreamt of being. I've never quite made it, but uh, anyway, opportunity knocks for communication. Dawn Chen arrived at her Singapore office at about 8.30 a.m. As the CEO of communication, she liked to arrive early as an example to her employees. She booted up her computer and reviewed her emails and her schedule for the day. Nothing too stressful. A couple of project reviews and a performance appraisal with Samantha Greenwood, the HRO manager, who was coming up to a year's service in the company. Suddenly a mail alert popped up on her computer and she saw urgent mail in the title. She clicked it open. It was forwarded by the admin group and it said, you'll want to see this RFP from GlobeNet. It could be big. Dawn read quickly through the RFP and then reread more slowly. Then she forwarded it to Tony Tanaka, the creative director who worked out of Hong Kong. Tony was responsible for major accounts and for managing business opportunities. Tony, look at this, said the message. It could be a big one and we'll have to do a lot of work in a short time. Can you call me at 10 o'clock to discuss how we respond and who we put on it? Dawn. Dawn was too excited to sit still, so she stood at the whiteboard listing the ideas to discuss with Tony. The problem with Tony, like all marketing people, he liked to promise everything to the customer and then finance and operations get upset that they have to deliver with an overtight budget or an impossible schedule. She would have to keep strict control over this one. At 10 o'clock, her WeChat tone burbled. Tony was as excited as her. If we win this bid and the project takes off, we could double our size and it gets us serious UK exposure. Agreed, said Dawn, but we have to win the proposal stage before we think of the implementation. We need to put a team together today to build our response. I'm happy to lead it, said Tony, but Dawn cut him off. No, I'd like you to coordinate, but I'll take a hands-on leadership role on this one. But I think you should come to Singapore for a few days so that we can work closely. Dawn knew Tony would not be happy that he was not the head, but he'd get over it. The RFP talks about related experience, so we'll need to have Vivek on the bid team. He did all the app design and metrics measurement for the Sports Channel launch in UK last year. Vivek and Tony did not get along. And it was good that one was in Bangalore and the other in Hong Kong. Vivek was a logic guy. His IT book was based on metrics and processes. And he couldn't relate to Tony's impetuous emotional decision making. Tony was quiet. He was obviously trying and failing to think of reasons why Vivek should not be included. Dawn decided to quit while she was winning. Okay, Tony, why don't we both spend some time thinking of next steps and who to include, and we'll talk again at 4 p.m. I'm cancelling everything else today. It would be good if you can too. <laughs> so that's the story, and you have to wait till the next unit three to see what, what happens, happens after that. <laughs> so I'll pass you back to Jane and back to the language issues. Okay, all right. So you kind of get a flavour of, of the intertextuality there, how you begin to know who these people are and how they operate. So this impacts the way you're going to communicate with them um, throughout, throughout the course. So I'm going to talk just a little bit as we finish off this presentation about the pedagogical approach. Um, I think the thing that sort of always struck me with some of the business communication materials that that I was I was using was how there was an assumption that you could have something sitting alone in an isolated place called the business report. Um, now, texts are connected. There is intertextuality. 
but texts are also situated. So I, I have, we have used in this book a pedagogical approach that takes into account the importance of the situation um, that these spoken and written texts occur by setting the context very clearly for each of the unit, modeling the kind of text, you're probably sort of, well, those of you that are teachers are not necessarily business experts will be saying, what the hell is a, is a request for proposal? What is this text, you know? And importantly, what's the response to that kind of text um, as a business proposal? So modeling those texts, deconstructing them so that students um, can see how they are structured, what kind of linguistic choices are going to be appropriate um, for that text. And then they put it all together and jointly, jointly construct the key texts, whether they're spoken or written um, in, in the course book. Now, this pedagogical approach is based on Jenny Hammond's work on scaffolding and Jim Martin and um, David Rose's work on the teaching and learning cycle that some of you may be um, aware of. It's very connected to systemic functional linguistics, if you're aware of this, but it looks at those key components where you, first of all, set the context and this is captured in our activity one where we're giving situation the story so far the background reading um, texts that are relevant to the unit at play the modeling and deconstruction which is captured in all our activities too um, so that students have a very good linguistic awareness of how these business texts actually unfold and what the features are and then in activity three which is the output where the students are actually very active in putting you know uh, a re request for proposal response together they know what that that response text looks like it's not something that is just pulled from the air they can see samples of those those texts that they're being yes. asked, and then yes, yes, yes. I'm done. so so it's based on the teaching and learning cycle. Now I've just put you know um, a unit two, a typical unit two, where you can see in activity one the readings, the story so far. So this picks up on the the situation. And then the activity two, which is the reading and writing text, we will actually deconstruct a request for a proposal, show them a sample of what it looks like, how it's put together, um, also show them samples of the response later on in the text before we actually ask them to do the work together. They have a very clear idea of how these texts operate. Um, the output skills are where they're actually writing. Um, so there will be a series of written and spoken texts for business email exchanges. And we keep reminding our students an email is not a particular text in itself, it's a vehicle. So we will be asking them to think about who they're writing to, what they know about the content, um, and what the function and main purpose of the email is before they pick up their pens and, and start writing. So there's some email exchanges there, internal and external, so they get a sense of it. The activity fours are where the students do a reflection activity on how they found that unit, what they found easy, what they found difficult. And there's also possibility for um, further readings, which is optional for the students, but, you know, I would suggest particularly if you've got postgraduate students, this is going to, again, give them a little bit of evidence and theory that they might not otherwise get. And I think teachers actually will find that very useful um, as they, you know, uh, prepare to, to use the course. They can understand the theory behind some of the activities that they are doing. 
So very quickly, and finally, the course includes a student book course book. Um, it's got three appendices in it. Um, the business vocab vocabulary and idioms are all highlighted in the spoken and written text and form a little um, uh, uh, list at the back that they can refer to. Um, there are full transcripts of all the listening sections, and there's also a reference, a final references section, where I've pulled together some of the current research um, uh, journal articles that, that uh, students and teachers might find interesting and useful. On, in the e-resources, there are the recordings of the listening texts. Um, so if, um, if teachers want to get the students developing their listening skills, then rather than reading the story so far, they might get them listening to the story so far and do some language work um, around that. So this is where we end. Um, there are some references here, um, but this is where we end and we're very happy to, you know, answer questions, take discussion, but I believe we've got a couple of people who um, may make some comments before we open it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Lockwood and Dr. Elias for the sharing. Uh, you guys heard it first from the minds behind the books. Uh, once again, thank you, Otis. Uh, right now, as uh, Dr. Lockwood has mentioned, we will have uh, two panelists that will share some comments on the book. Uh, firstly, I would like to welcome Dr. Xu Xiaoyu, Assistant Professor, Department of English from the City University of Hong Kong. Uh, Dr. Xu, are you here? Can you please yes, turn yes, on the I'm camera? Here. Yeah, could you share some comments on the, the book? Sure, sure. So, but first of all, I'd like to uh, introduce a little bit more about myself. Um, I think one of the reasons why I'm invited to give a comment is because I'm currently coordinating a um, big business communication course in CityU. And um, um, I'm, a I'm actually convinced to use James and uh, Neil's book because it's uh, a fantastic fantastic textbook. So perhaps I'll first of all make some comments on the book that convinced me, um, our head of department, and also the College of Business to use it as the textbook for our business um, communication course. So first of all, um, I think it's amazing that uh, Neil has brought many different genres, very important business genres in one story throughout the book. Um, I've actually read through the book already and it's almost like uh, following a TV series. And uh, <laughs> um, I was wondering what's coming up in the next episode, you know? So um, I, I'm sure that it would be very effective in motivating our students. Um, because also for another course offered by our department, which is um, 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 English for engineering purposes, so that course also has a storyline and this, um, I've taught it once and it, it was very effective in motivating students. So I'm sure for business com communication, this will work as well. Um, and this, the second uh, comment uh, is, is that the book is based on up-to-date research um, and takes into account virtual communication, accommodation, intertextuality, authenticity, like Jane uh, has mentioned in the talk already. Um, so I think this book will be able to address um, a few key issues we came across previously in the course. Um, for example, after all the business meetings were moved online, we encounter many issues during the assessments because our teaching materials um, focus only on face-to-face -face, um, business, business meetings, not really uh, virtual meetings. So we uh, observed um, many more communicative breakdowns during the business assessment. Um, so I think the new test, this textbook will be able to address that. Um, and also we noticed that students, they expect each other to sort of uh, reach the level of first language speakers uh, English proficiency. So whenever a, um, a partner in a team 
um, doesn't speak English very well, they don't know what to do. So I think in such a situation, if we um, give students some input about accommodation, they will understand that, okay, um, it's very normal that we are speaking to a second language speaker. It's very normal that they will make uh, grammatical mistakes. There will be some misunderstanding, but we can use some strategies to cope with that. So uh, that's an important issue that uh, we want to address as well. I'm glad that this is taken into account in this textbook. Um, and also, yes, authenticity um, is, is very important. The current textbook we are using um, drew on references from the 90s and even the 80s, so that they're already outdated. We don't really know, you know, our instructors, our course team, uh, we didn't really work in the uh, business industries. We, we don't know how to come up with authentic uh, materials. So it's great that um, the book um, provide such materials. So I'm very positive that the issues we came across uh, will be addressed by this textbook. Uh, I'm also very uh, happy to see there is a word list and phrase list at the back of the, the book, right, Jane? Mm. So that comes with the all the readings so it's great that um instructors will be able to um kind of um conduct flipped classroom so all these teaching uh reading materials could be given by uh, could be given to the students and they can do the readings by themselves before coming to the class um if you look at the teaching hours of the textbook it's 70 hours right jane Yes, yes. Yeah, but usually uh, university GE courses only um, provide 35, 37, 39 hours. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the number exactly. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's great that some of the, the materials could be given as homework or pre-reading uh, for the course. Uh, so these are the comments on the great things that I noticed about this uh, textbook. Um, and in the meantime, if Jane and Neil don't mind, I'll also comment on some, i give some suggestions in terms of the materials our students and instructors would like to, like the book to offer um, that are not currently included in the, in this edition. Mm. Mm. So the, the first thing um, I noticed is that um, the book only provides um, listening recordings. I actually have mentioned this to Jane uh, once in a, in a uh, mm. coffee chat already. Mm. Um, so I think the students will appreciate multimodal samples like video recordings mm. because um, listening recordings don't really show students, you know, mm. gestures, um, gazes, uh, facial expressions. Mm. Um, and our students actually um, really lack such skills. Mm. They don't know how to move their body. They feel very awkward in the, in the meeting communication, for example. Um, so it'd be great to have, uh, for example, a video sample of virtual meeting, mm. a video sample of presentation. Um, yes, just to show them that how all these multimodal communication resources can be um, put together in one occasion. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's one comment. Mm. Um, another comment is about, um, you know, supporting instructors, mm. because I noticed that some of the um, questions don't come with um, um, suggested answers or, mm -hmm. um, or notes for teachers, um, particularly some kind of discourse analysis of the sample. Mm -hmm. A material like a uh, um, respond to proposal. Um, so there is a, a written sample there and a question about what are the discursive features in this piece of text. Uh, so it would be great if we can provide some teacher mm. notes so, so the instructors know what to uh, provide to the mm. students. Yeah, because my experience with uh, the instructors on my course is that they know very little about business communication mm -hmm. and they don't mm -hmm. know how to uh, 
what to say about one sample, and that's very very common. So it'd be great if at least for those this um, this course mm. analysis activities there could be mm. some teacher notes. Mm. Yeah. So I think these are the two main suggestions yeah. I like to uh, yeah. give. And generally, I think this uh, textbook is um, well at least um, to me it's the best textbook i've um, i've read so far because it, it really ad uh, addresses many issues we came across before um that are, that are not um uh, i don't see how they can be addressed by other textbooks that i've read yeah thank Great. you thank you dr shu that was very informative